Welcome. My name is Simone Chandel, and I am head of events at Women in Mining UK. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for a very special event, kindly supported by Women on Boards UK. Before we officially start, I would like to run through a few housekeeping points. Please note, we are recording today's event, which will be available for playback on our YouTube channel. So please do look out for it. And if you could be so kind to keep your mics on mute during the panel discussion, that would be greatly appreciated. Your cameras have been turned off for now, but feel free to switch them on at any time. And we will be taking questions from our audience, time permitting, via the chat button at the bottom of your screen. I must give my thanks to fellow WIM UK volunteer, Sandra Bates, who is responsible for organizing today's event and is joining us as a speaker as well. Sandra, thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to support us. And to lead us into today's event, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, Rachel Tranter. Rachel is co-founding director of Women on Boards UK. She spent 18 years as an international corporate tax consultant working with Price Waterhouse Coopers. After leaving in 2008, she joined Cardio Direct Limited. Rachel joined the board of the Amateur FA as an independent non-executive director and is also an independent panel member of the Ministry of Justice. Rachel, thank you for jumping in the moderator's seat. I'd like to hand over to you to start us off. Simon, thank you very much for that introduction and hello to everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be uh, joining you. Um, so very briefly, yes, I am a, um, uh, a founder and, and uh, director of Women on Boards. And uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are here to support you on your journey to the boardroom. I am going to spend uh, no more than five minutes, and I've actually tried to be so disciplined, I've actually put a, a timer on me to stop me because this is a subject I could talk about forever. Um, but I'm going to basically just talk to you ever so briefly uh, to introduce you to the concept of your boardroom journey. And then we're gonna go straight into the panel and get everybody's uh, contributions today. So what, what do I want to say? I guess really, I want to kick off with the concept that, you know what, your boardroom journey, it's, it's your own journey. We're all unique and we all are starting from, from different points. We're, some of you in the room today, obviously I don't know you, but some of you will be young, ambitious, starting your career. Some of you will be mid-career. Some of you may be our senior and you're transitioning and starting to think about portfolio. But wherever you are in your career, there's never a better time now than now to actually start looking and thinking about your boardroom journey. So where do you actually begin? What I want you to remember is that you're in control of this journey. It's up to you whether you want to start and whether you want to take board, rules, board roles or not. So how about we think about why you, why you even should be thinking about joining a board? Why join? It could be that it enables you to give something back to the community. Have you thought about joining a not-for-profit board? It could be that you're thinking about your career resilience, your own CV. What are you thinking about? Do you want to go into the boardroom to meet some people that you've never met before? people in different industries? Do you want to think outside of your network? So maybe going onto the board could actually open up the door to a post-exec board career. There are many, many reasons why we join boards. And I think from the discussion we're gonna have with the panel today, we're probably gonna hear uh, why some of us today have decided to, to take on non-exec positions. So we at Women on Boards firmly believe that there is a board role there for everybody. So what are the challenges? Because so far I've probably made it sound ever so straightforward. It's not. The challenges to me, and this is why I'm gonna whiz through the, these in a, in a few minutes. What is my value add? What do I take to the boardroom? What do you think you can take to the boardroom? Where are the roles? How do I even find out about these non-exec positions? What do I mean by non-exec position? Trustee, non-exec, sports board, listed roles, private, public. There are so many opportunities for you to think about. Where do you begin? Where do you find them? How do I succeed? How do I actually get that board role? 
And actually, how do I maintain that role? How do I, re how do I stay match fit? So these are just some things that I want you to, to start thinking about. Um, in terms of that value add piece, that is very much about your skills. And I like to think of that as your NED toolkit. Now, we all need a board CV to be, to be able to really demonstrate and articulate that value add. Some of you might have a board CV already. Some of you might have an exec CV and a board CV. Um, some of you might be sitting here thinking, well, what do you mean board CV? Um, it's a challenge, but trust me, once you've created that board CV and you pull out your board value add, you'll have so much confidence about starting on this journey. So what's your value add and how are you going to put that in a board CV? That's something I want you to think about. Um, the second thing, where are the roles? There is a challenge. Use your networks. Use the people that you know. Think about what your personal network is, your private network. And then think about your own industry network, your own corporate network. Think about professional networks that you could join. I'm not here to tell you to join women on boards at all, but what I would say is if you've got time to invest in yourself, do it. Think about joining uh, NEDA. Think about exec appointments. Think about women on boards. Headhunters. Carol's gonna to touch on that in a, in, a, in a few minutes when we start going to the, when we head into the panel section. But headhunters, who are the headhunters in the sectors that you're thinking about? Do we know them? It can be a challenge to find them, but it's well worth investing that time and connecting with the right headhunters in the sector that you're thinking about. LinkedIn, do not underestimate the power of LinkedIn. Lots of organizations go directly now to LinkedIn to look for non-execs. They may be going round search, but do keep yourself, your profile up to date on LinkedIn. Finally, tell people, don't be afraid of telling people that you're looking. It, it's okay to, to tell your, your employer that you're looking. Tell your clients whatever you think is appropriate for you in your particular role, in your particular sector. But the more, the more you voice what you're thinking, uh, the less challenging and the more supported you'll feel. So what else did I say the challenges were? I guess, how do I, how do I succeed? Um, I'm conscious of the fact I'm running a bit out of time, um, but how do you succeed? I'd say invest in yourself. Invest in the type of things I've talked about. Identify what you're thinking about. Start to think about what boards are looking for. What does being a board member really mean? What are the legal and fiduciary responsibilities of, of NEDS? So start investing a bit of time now. There is never, as I said at the beginning, a better time now than to be strategic and think about where you want to be in two years time and start putting the plan together now. Final point I want to make before I want to, uh, to hand over briefly to among some poll questions um, is think about how you're gonna manage your portfolio. If you are on a board, you have to stay match fit and there has never been a better time than, than now to actually use your network for support when you're actually in the boardroom. Peer-to-peer -peer support, as we've recognised over the last year and a half, is vital. And how are you going to stay match fit? Use your network, use your resources. How are you going to keep up to date with AI, cybersecurity, ESG, whatever it might be? Keep in touch and make sure that you are ahead of the game uh, in terms of corporate governance and, and whatever it might be. So I'd like to stop there, Eman, um, Eman and maybe we can bring in the, the poll questions. So I'm gonna read this out uh, for, for those who, who may have been also for the recording actually. What I'd like you to, uh, to answer, it's a simple yes, no. Have you thought about joining a board? Interesting. So that is an overwhelming 88% of you that you thought about joining a board. Um, what I should say now is do use the chat function um, in, uh, in the session today to throw any comments, observations, any questions in, because if you're thinking about joining a board, you must have some questions. So I would say, uh, please put them in because we're going to have a 10 minute session, hopefully at the end, where we will cover and try and bring in your questions. So that's, a, that's quite a powerful uh, message there. Should we uh, bring in the second question? Right. 
are you currently on a board? And before you answer this, I want you to think about all boards, not-for-profit, committee roles, trustee roles, school governor roles, all the way through to listed. Are you currently on any of those boards? Okay, so that's impressive. 75% of you have said you're currently on a board. So again, what would be quite nice to pick up in the chat room if people have got the opportunity to do it, possibly mention what board you're on. It'd be really good to see. Brilliant. So what I think we should do now is bring the panel in. And so we've got Sheila, Sandra and Carol, who very neatly on my screen are all sitting next to me at the top. Um, so maybe what we could do is ask you really briefly to introduce yourselves before I throw some questions at you. Sheila, would you like to go, to go first? Yes, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, Women in Mining and uh, the Women on Boards UK for having me. I'm speaking to you from Haburoni in Botswana today. I am uh, done with nine to five. But uh, I have been serving on boards now since uh, the late 90s. And I've moved from private to publicly listed corporations. But I've also worked for the World Bank and the, the ADB. And so I sort of bring a balance of uh, the private and the public sector. My current portfolio, and I, I thought it was interesting that you spoke about the portfolio. I was very clear before uh, leaving 9 to 5 that I had an even greater life ahead of me. And, and that it was a life in which I was going to do only the things I wanted to do. And they are consulting, using my skills to advise mainly African governments in mineral oil and gas, but also serving as a non-executive uh, director. I also am writing, I've just uh, self-published a, a book, which is a public good on corporate governance. Uh, and I'm writing my memoirs, and then I volunteer. So that's sort of what I'm doing now, uh, from literally 7 a.m. every day to 8 p.m. So there you have it. There's life after nine to five. Thank you for having me. Brilliant, thanks so much. Sandra. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, rookie error. Um, right, yes, thank you very much. I'm, um, I've been a corporate lawyer for my entire career, 20 plus years. And before that, I've, I was uh, trained as an accountant as well. So I've, I've always had in my mind that um, I would like to take on NED roles in my future and to, to move to a sort of portfolio career once, I'm, once I was done again with the nine to five. Um, not that I think, Sheila, you ever did nine to five by the sound of it. <laughs> Sounds like it's much longer than that. Um, but uh, it's it's come along for me. The Ned role came along probably in advance of when I thought I was ready. And that's one of some of my key messages today. Um, but so many of you are already on board, so I think I'm preaching to the converted. Um, so I, I've had a, a long career in law firms and also in private practice. Um, very much been on the le legal advisory side. I've advised lots of boards. Um, the Ned roles give me a unique sort of perspective. Um, it's very different and um, really enjoyable. It's uh, I, I can't recommend it enough. I think having a portfolio career, if you can manage it and plan it and execute it, um, yes, has some challenges, but um, completely satisfies my my curious nature. And um, yes, I, I bounce out of bed every day, and, and it's um, incredibly varied and, and interesting and rewarding actually. Thank you. And Carol. Hi, everybody. Great to see um, so many familiar names on that um, joining this this uh, session today. So, yeah, I I sort of took a similar route, I think, to Sandra in that um, I felt in my career that my executive career that I wasn't ready to to completely jump off the cliff and ab abandon the, the nine to five. Uh, for all sorts of reasons. So I kind of wanted to do, have a, a foot in both camps. So my executive role, I am a partner and the co-head of energy and resources at Brunswick. And Brunswick is a strategic advisory um, agency with offices around the world. And obviously I specialize as I said in energy and resources, more mining than, than the energy side. And <clears throat> so I was lucky enough to get my first board position about um, eight years ago. 
and being able to manage that non-executive role with the executive role. Um, I found that, um, yeah, it was, it was a challenge, but um, if, you're, if you're super organized, you can do it. And I was able to take on the chair of Women in Mining, and then I, I took on another non-executive role uh, with, um, a, um, with, with CQS, um, uh, Natural Resources Growth and Income. So I've got, I guess, two non-execs, the chair of women in mining, obviously, which is, um, which is volunteer, and then my, um, and my executive role. And I guess the, the, you know, the challenge that, that, I, that I find, or and everybody would find anyway, is just sort of you know, um, uh, managing your time to, uh, to be able to do all of those uh, well, and knowing when, when you're maxed out, knowing when you know, it's, time to, it's time to stop. So that's kind of been my, my journey. It has been keeping a foot in both the non-exec camp and the executive camp. And then I guess eventually will be to, to move more to a non-executive position once I decide to uh, say farewell to the nine to five and win the lottery. <laughs> um, yes, um, thank you. And actually, Carol, I'd like to uh, maybe uh, explore a little bit more about what you've touched on in terms of because you, you've summed up your, your journey to date uh, brilliantly. Um, can, can you possibly share a little bit more around, you know, maybe some of the, the highlights because you've been doing this, as you say, now for eight years. Uh, what are some of the highlights that you can share with us and, and possibly some of the, the, the uh, uh, challenges as, as well as obviously what you've already mentioned in terms of juggling those two, uh, two different types of roles? Sure. I think, you know, for me, the highlights really are all about the people. And, you know, I'm lucky enough. And I say lucky because I always think there is an element of luck in, in you know, in um, everything that we do. Obviously, you try to mitigate, you know, the, the downside by doing as much due diligence as you can. But, you know, I work with incredible people. Um, I work for, with, you know, my my fellow non-executive directors of both my boards are just an absolute pleasure and delight to work with. We have a, you know, a great rapport. We all have bring different strengths and different voices into the boardroom. So, which, which is incredibly uplifting because you're always learning from each other. So I would say that, the, you know, the highlights are definitely the people. And it's not only the directors, the non-executive directors, it's the management teams that you get to know and you get to, to work with. And especially, you know, if you're working for um, a company with, you know, an operating company, you get to know the general manager as you get to visit the site, you start to build up a relationship with, you know, with the, the employees. And, and, and again, it's incredibly uplifting and just so rewarding and you just learn so much. I would say ch challenges, yeah, there's a lot of challenges in, in my last eight years. Um, and I don't, won't necessarily go into the detail, but I would say that, it, Ours is a cyclical industry, so the go, going on a board of a cyclical company is always going to ebb and flow. You're always going to that when the company is doing well, you're not going to have that many challenges. When the company is not doing well because the cycle changes, you've got all sorts of challenges to you know to be able to deal with. And with my Nearstar role, obviously, you know, there's a, a lot of challenges around that, around that company. Um, the board, the current board inherited some poor strategic decisions. Um, the market went against the company um, and put the company in severe financial distress. And we ended up doing a, in 2019, a financial restructuring. So I've seen three CEOs, two CFOs, two rescue rights issues, um, a financial and a financial restructuring, but we saved through over 3000 jobs, you know? So, you, you know, you see there, there are challenges when you're working in a, in a cyclical industry. And I guess you just always have to look beyond that and um, keep your, your wits about you and um, make sure that, your um, your horizon scanning those risks as best you possibly can. It's lovely to hear you talk about people uh, and notwithstanding the challenges uh, that people still are obviously so so important to you and are what motivate you to do what you do. Uh, and uh, I mean, you you mentioned luck as well, and we we all think we're we're we're, we're lucky. And sometimes luck can play a part, can't it? But you know, it's also been. Uh, being the right person with the right skills and being as committed as, as you clearly are. 
Um, so, um, Sandra, what I'd like to do possibly is ask, ask you a question now um, around, uh, I touched very briefly uh, upon the, the concept of how taking a ball role can, can help progress your career. Um, what are your thoughts on this and how do roles currently play a part in your career? Thanks for that. It's a really interesting question. I mean, it's, especially for me, I'm still um, in my executive role uh, to a certain extent being an advisor via a law firm, um, albeit as a consultant. So I've still very much got that part of you know my practice ongoing. Um, and, and that has a lot of interaction with, with other different people as well and colleagues. And I think that having the, the board perspective, despite having advised boards, uh, you can never you know, find a substitute for sitting in the seats yourself, making the decisions, having the liability, hanging on the other end. Um, so for me, um, I know what I want to see and do as a director, and I, I know what a board needs or a committee needs. Um, and that's really helped me on the advisory side because I, I'm, I'm always, by just by definition, putting myself in the shoes of, of the board. And I think that, that certainly progressed my career um, in a, dif a different direction. I mean, it's, it's even very different from being in-house. So, I mean, the, the broadening of the horizons as well, the, the, the breadth of knowledge I have in the industry. And I, I thought I, I walked into the um, first directorship at Adriatic Metals thinking I knew quite a lot about mining, um, not just on the legal side, but my goodness, you learn a, a hell of a lot uh, on, on both the industry, companies in general, you know, HR matters, um, licensing the, the works, um, as well as the legal documentation and, um, and the, the foibles of the London capital markets, you know, it's 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 got it all. And I guess my personality is certainly more information is better. So I'll get get down and get into the weeds. Um, and yet you, you, it's fascinating. I mean, you learn so much, and uh, that that is always a good thing, right? I mean, if you're if you've always got your your eyes and ears open, um, it's it's always going to help. Uh, the the other key thing is it's back to the people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very much a people person. And despite being on Zoom for most of the time in the last 18 months, uh, you know, it's just been incredible to, to meet people and work with them. Um, and, and you realize the connections. It's a very it's a very tight knit group on a board. And like anything, it's another network that you have to work out how to navigate. Um, so so that's been really interesting. And um, for me, really developmental in terms of of confidence and, you know, interacting at a senior level and knowing that, you know, I. I ought to be here. Um, I've got a voice, and and frankly, people people want to hear it. And it's interesting because you, you made a, a point which is is a really important one that we, we must all remember that 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 going on a board is especially when you are mid career. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, it, it's a two way learning, isn't it? You, yes, you're taking to the board, but you're taking something back, um, and it's not just the the. Uh, the environment, but you're also, I suspect, learning things about yourself that you didn't realise, skills that you that you have that you maybe didn't realise you had until they ask you in in the boardroom, and you suddenly realise you're actually quite an expert on many different things, maybe people. Um, so thank you, thank you for that, um, Sheila. Um, hi, I'd like to, if if I can bring you in here. Um, thank you so much for 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 joining us uh, on this uh, session. And I'd like to, to maybe get your perspective on uh, whether there is a difference between boards of different legal entities. Um, and so here I'm thinking about listed companies versus private companies or maybe state-owned entities. Just wonder whether you're, what your perspective is on that. Yes, thank you very much. I think that uh, based particularly on, on your opening remarks, uh, and in trying to help people decide what their direction might be. I think this is a, a, an important question worth thinking about. I mean, um, Sandra being a lawyer is probably more qualified to speak on this, but she's probably overqualified, so I'll take it. Um, but the, the, the point, I, the way I see the, is, is that um, at the top level is the similarity, which is that the role of any board, regardless of the legal structure, is basically the fiduciary responsibility, which is to look after the interests of those that the board represents. And the interests are 
are themselves hierarchical. You have the shareholders, you have the employees, you have the customers, you have the, uh, the financiers and so forth. So, so if you think of it that way, the boards of these entities in terms of their mandate is fundamentally the same. However, what separates them is the legal frameworks that governs them. How, the, in terms of what is uh, right or wrong, how they conduct themselves, how they account and who they account to. Uh, if if one looks, for instance, at private companies, which is companies that may be family owned, basically this is a family business, and discussions take place around dinner, and the patriarch is typically the chair, uh, and 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 so in that way they they are different in terms of public scrutiny, but also in terms of how, what we hold them to account for. By contrast, if one looks then at publicly listed companies, because they operate in the public space, uh, the public is very exposed and is vulnerable to the actions of those companies. So they tend to be very scrutinized and the, the, the regulatory requirements very, and reporting uh, requirements very onerous. And so if, if one is thinking of uh, going into uh, the boardroom of such companies, one really has to think about the environment in terms of both the level of responsibility, the extent to which it is onerous, but also the extent to which you as a director could be vulnerable to liability just because of the space. Uh, quite apart from the legal aspects, of course, is as we can see today, civil society is very active in this space. So in the past, we used to account to shareholders primarily. My genuine sense is now we account to somewhere between the advocacy groups and the fund managers, thanks to the ESG. And so there's a whole dynamic. But uh, the, the one area that it, I think, uh, in, or one type of company that is particularly interesting, especially in my part of the world and in the mineral oils and sector space is what are called state-owned entities. These are different for several reasons. One. Uh, these are companies that are really uh, developing and extracting resources that already belong to the public. And so, and, and, and the, the uh, commodities are also finite. So here sustainability becomes particularly uh, a, a challenge. However, because they tend to always be uh, created by special instruments, they, they, they do, at least in my experience, lack the level of governance that they ought to be subject to. Because in my mind, at least in terms of public good and public interest, they should be no less uh, scrutinized than public listed companies. But they tend to be protected because they are an entity of the sovereign state. And like, if you wish, a child in the family, they are given a pass. But, but generally, I think uh, anybody thinking of uh, going into the board, it's worth thinking where in this space do I want to go and why, and how prepared I am uh, for that role and what risks does this bring. Otherwise, you could write uh, several books about this, but I, I, I think the audience get it. Thank yeah. you very much, uh, Rachel. Thank you. So yeah, due diligence is all, uh, is, is such, a, such a key message. And also, uh, it's that huge stakeholder management piece, isn't it? going in there knowing who those stakeholders are and making sure that you can, you've got plenty of experiences that you can demonstrate uh, that you know how to do it. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for that. Um, Carol, I'd like to, to, to turn to you now and shift a little bit around, um, I guess around the point that uh, we, we mentioned at the beginning about the importance of your network. Uh, I wonder whether you could maybe touch upon that and any advice that you've got for the people listening today around uh, the importance of your network and possibly touch on the, head, the headhunter point. Sure. Um, can I be really rude, Rachel, and ask if I can just follow up on Sheila's really oh, super yeah. important point about stakeholder primacy? Because this is, you know, what, what, I guess eight years on a board is not that much, right? But in that, weirdly, in that eight years that I've been sort of on various boards, I've seen two massive shifts in the sort of roles and responsibilities of directors. And I'm sure everybody on this call um, will, you know, will, will have seen those shifts as well. The first one was, I guess, when I first joined a board, which was joining a board um, as a younger 
person, still in an executive role, I probably didn't really know the difference between a non-exec and an executive. So I was willing to roll my sleeves up. But that board at the time, they were all, um, you know, 75 year old white guys and all they did was go for lunch and you know talk about the wine and a bit of politics um, and that was very very old school boards and that's changed in in the last eight years massively we're having younger um, non-executive directors we're having more and more non-executive directors take on not an executive role but just be more hands-on so doing something beyond just going to lunch and, the, and then the, the, so the, that's the first shift that I've seen. And the second shift that Sheila pointed out is, is the move toward away from um, a sole stakeholder, i.e. Being, you know, being the shareholder, the responsibility of the board to represent and the, the best interest of just a shareholder to stakeholder privacy, where it's our responsibility to represent the, the best interests of all stakeholders. And that is a really, really important strategic uh, shift because, because of that responsibility that we take on as board directors, and that will only continue to, um, to increase because we're getting legislative changes around that. Um, we, we're, we've got you know, the rules and regulations as set by, down by um, the FCA or whatever regulator in whichever country that you're, uh, that you're in. We have you know, reporting changes. You know, now we've got you know obligations to report against climate, around biodiver against biodiversity. All of this stuff means that we are on even more of a learning curve than we ever than we ever have been in the in you know it, certainly in in my career, um, and more responsibility and more fiduciary duty and financial and reputational liability. Um, so I just wanted to, I don't, I don't know, Sheila, if you, if you wanted to come back on that, but I think you make such an important point about that stakeholder privacy point. If I could, somebody has asked a question because I think it, it fits directly into the, yeah, uh, Caroline ha, has said, who are you responsible for, the shareholders or the employees or the company? And, and, I, and I think a, a huge part of this uh, shift in mindset sits in that particular space. So uh, I, I, I imagine many of us will know that uh, for the longest time, the round table in the US said that uh, the companies are uh, accounted to the shareholders. But uh, two years ago, they said, actually, we account to the community and the betterment of uh, the society. Yeah. That I think speaks profoundly to that mindset change. And so it's no longer about any single stakeholder group, but it's about the totality and the balancing of uh, the interests of those stakeholders. And if the ESGs are anything to go by, what is missing in this question is the environment. The environment has taken a human persona in its importance strategically in the boardroom. It's almost now more important than the shareholders. All you got to do is look at the discussions in the Dutch uh, courts. All you got to do is look at the AGMs of oil companies. Uh, it, it's all about the environment. And, and so I think the way to think about it is that you have stakeholders. They, depending on the circumstances, the hierarchy of importance changes. It is no longer a, 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 a static uh, hierarchical uh, structure that you can say, this is the single most important stakeholder. That is certainly how I see it in the boards or, uh, on which I have served over the years. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, because of that, an emerging risk um, to boards, to companies, and, and therefore to, to boards, so boards need to think about this, um, is, um, is the risk of advocacy. Um, because now, you know, it, Everybody is an advocate, and they tend to you know, advocacy around climate or ESG uh, related issues is 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 very important and is becoming more mainstream. So it is something that you know that that boards have to have have to have conversations, strategic conversations around. So I'm um, sorry, Sandra, Rachel, you... I, I I took you. No, off no, track. no, don't. I just wanted, Sandra. Did you want to come in on that one? No, I completely agree. Um, 
you know, the the ESG um, is is no longer the elephant in the room. I mean, it's the, it's the only thing in the room for for a lot of the time. Um, you know, in mining, we've talked about social license to operate, and I, I I see that as much broader. But I think as as companies in the extractives industry, we're probably ahead of where, say, a fashion retailer might be, or a startup website, or whatever. Um, so actually, these companies are really well placed to tackle it. But the the issue is the regulations, the fads, what investors want to see. It, it's changing literally every every week or every month, and you've you've got to try and stay ahead of it. Um, and it's it's very very difficult. It's challenging in the extreme, and I think I, I don't see the pace um, you know decreasing. I'm not sure if anyone else does, but I had uh, I I watched a, an ESG panel recently, and Adam Matthews. I think made a really great comment. He's the Church of England pension fund um, head of ESG, I think he is. And he said, you know, boards need to understand that the decisions they make today will be judged against the standards that exist in 10 years time. Now, we don't know what the standards are going to be next year, much less 10 years time. So, you know, you've you've really got to be, um, and, and it's far beyond that that really essential risk assessment um, tool that um, that each director on the board needs to have um, it, it does go beyond that. It's a little bit of crystal wall gazing and it's that balancing act. So it's so tough. I would say technical point under the UK Companies Act, we're required to look and we have done for, for quite a few years now. This was changed, I think, in 06. Um, we're required to look at as a board, not just our shareholders, but employees, the environment. You know, there, there's a sort of laundry list of, of considerations and that's what your duties relate to. So for, for UK listed companies, this is, has always been the case, but really only lip service has been paid to it and very, very little attention has been paid to it. And so, and that's all changing. I mean, the, the other issue is um, more recent development on the legal side is class actions against companies. Um, and, and Sheila's quite right in, in mentioning the, the AGM results. Uh, you know, that's, they've got real teeth and um, and that's that's the big boys who have the best advice in the world and the biggest boards and the most experience at their fingertips. Um, so pity pity those of us further down the food chain who are <laughs> sort of scrambling along, making sure we're, we're trying to be compliant and, and keep up. Thank you. Um, Carol, I'm going to take yes. you back to the original, if you don't mind. That was yeah. brilliant, thank you. And do I do really want everyone just to contribute in that way, so that's brilliant. Um, Carol, can I come back to my uh, question around the importance of networks, maybe, uh, in terms of how you, you know, how you uh, develop your, your board roles and your portfolio and the importance of uh, headhunters? Yeah, sure. And it, it's it's a nice segue to um, what what Sandra was just talking about. You know, how do you keep how do you keep abreast of all of this change? Because it is it's it's mind-boggling it's it's fast it's going in different directions um everybody's trying to kind of figure out you know climate change and esg uh for the first time so nobody really knows what they're doing we just know we're marching in the right direction so how do you keep on top of all of these all of these changes and and your network is absolutely key for that so you know i would say Join all the lawyers and the um, and the account accountancy firms, um, and probably the headhunters as well. But I certainly know the lawyers and the accountancy firms. They have um, memberships that you can join as a non-executive director. Join them. I mean, I do a lot with Deloitte. I'm not saying, and I think they're great. I'm not saying that they're the only one, but um, the the others will do. They they will have a program as well. The one that I spend a lot of time with is the Deloitte Academy. And if you're already on a board, then you just need somebody. To to recommend you to join that, um, to join the academy. You actually need somebody from Deloitte, I should say, to recommend you. Um, but they have um, a series, a whole series all year round of um, lectures around, you know, accounting standards, changes, um, legal frameworks, ESG, climate change, whatever it happens to be. But all the law firms and the accountancy firms do that. So that's a great way of not only expanding your existing network and uh, and sort of shoring up your shoring up your existing network and expanding it, but also learning something and under, un, learning how things are changing. And with respect to the the headhunters, it's the same. 
um, it's exactly the same. They we, they have um, programs, but I would say find out who the who's the head of the board practice and all the, the headhunters that you've heard of, and go and meet them for coffee. And you know they they don't necessarily have um, an interest to spend a huge amount of time with you because you're not paying the bills. Their clients are, but they're always looking for new faces. And they you know and if you help them out, if you give if you give something back to them, if they're looking for somebody and you're not the right candidate, but you give them a couple of names who may be the right candidate or at least open up you know a new series of doors for them that they didn't necessarily already have then you become quite valuable to them and you all of a sudden your value increases as that relationship grows and you end up getting on more of their list than you ever have done before and then there's other and then with women on boards obviously um it's a great network and um there's, you know, Rachel and the and the team. You get a daily email from from them on um, positions uh, in your inbox or just events that they're doing, that sort of thing. So that's also a really great network to leverage. Um, and then there's something that you probably already know about, but it's um, it's a, a, a company called New Role. And actually, that's how I got my CQS board position. Use um, the the um, the, comp the fund to use use New Role and a couple of other. Um, positions have come my way, which unfortunately I didn't have time to take on, but um, through also through New Role. And it's great, you know, the, it's a really good service. Corporates love to use it because it's not that expensive. They've got a great network um, and it's a really good way of just constantly sort of seeing what else is out there. Um, but definitely, yeah, networks are, um, are hugely, hugely important. And it's not easy when we're not allowed to have lunch together. So um, you've got to be a bit more inventive. Yeah, that is correct. I, I, I'd absolutely endorse everything everything you've said there because it's about using your network to get on the ladder and then it's continuing to uh, take all the support uh, that you can get to progress. And you have to be, you have to think ahead, don't you? You have to think, well, I might be stepping off this board in a year's time. I might be stepping off this board in two years time. So think ahead. What, what's your next move? Uh, so that network continues to be to be um, important. Um, Sandra, I wanted to with, with you know staying staying aware and, and and being aware of all the different challenges and all the issues has, has been a bit of a, a theme throughout the the conversation so far. Um, I'd like to I suppose ask you a question around that um, because I think it's fair to say and you said this to me only yesterday actually. It might be relatively straightforward uh, for someone like yourself, a, a very senior experienced lawyer, to get onto the board in the first place. The challenges come when you're actually in the boardroom uh, in terms of, um, you know, what the, the challenges you face. Do you necessarily know everything? Um, so what would you what would your advice be to people around that? And how do you stay uh, match fit in terms of? that knowledge and awareness of the bigger issues going on around you. Oh, thanks, Rachel. Yeah, there are a couple of a couple of points there. I mean, um, certainly don't know everything. That that's uh, that, I knew that before I joined the boards, but uh, yeah, that, that's that's certainly been proven at least to me. Um, look, you've the the challenges uh, for a lawyer or anyone with a very specific expertise is that you become um, a quasi advisor which is not what you're there for it's a conflict uh, all sorts of issues arise um and and this just sort of goes back to your due diligence you you need to step back when a board position becomes available and think okay what do they need why do they want me um if you're looking at a smaller board or a, or a perhaps a, a you know not a public board um family type office you know, is is this a way that they're getting technical expertise in whichever area it might be, uh, a lot cheaper than than they would be getting if they they got an external advisor? And I, I think certainly for lawyers on boards, this is this is a you know it's something just worth bearing in mind. Um, I'm not sure companies know um, at the outset what they what they're getting, but I think they they're probably thinking that that way uh, um, along the along the path. Uh, what you can really help with, and this comes back to network actually, is when you're on a board, whatever the issue that might arise, you probably know someone who can really add value to, you know, to the conversation or to bounce, you know, to bounce the idea off and 
So it's not just um, reading around everything. I, I think Deloitte Academy, I, I really rate, um, on, certainly on the accounting side, but that, that sort of continuing knowledge is extremely important. Um, but yeah, those, it's those conversations with someone who might be a mentor. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who's gone through a career really without having a, a mentor um, of any flavor through various law firms. Uh, and you know, now as a Ned, I can see that actually I, I do have people to call on and they're from all sorts of different walks of life who I've come across along the way. And God, they're incredibly valuable. You know, you, you sometimes need that. Sometimes it might be someone else on the board who's been there longer, who has more background, who understands, dare I say, the politics of the situation. Um, pick up the phone to them. You know, if you've got a concern or if you're trying to trying to solve something, that's that's a really good way of doing it. Um, match fit uh, can also come, as I said, from people who you know have come across something similar or been through um, been through the financial reorganisation. Carol was talking about, you know, lit <laughs> it's the business. Um, you know, litigation as well. Uh, touch wood, I haven't I haven't had to uh, deal with terribly much of that as yet. But you know, going just chatting it through with someone that you trust, who you know will keep things confidential, um, can really, really add value. No doubt about that. Uh, but, but also, um, you know, doing doing your diligence on the way in the door uh, is. So I can't emphasize it enough. It's it's so important. Not not just on the company, but the people who who sit on the board, the key stakeholders. It might be a shareholder with a bit of history. You know, ask all those difficult questions because really, as a board member, that's what you're there for. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Uh, and apologies that uh, you've got boosters on your recording, Omar. Uh, so, um, Sheila, I wonder whether I could bring you in at this point. I'm conscious of time, but I would love to get uh, if you can pull some out of the bag, some top tips uh, for people listening today. From looking at the chat room, we've got a real mix, but there are some, you know, some people on some 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 serious boards out there listening today. So it's not so much those who are starting out; it's more those who are uh, who maybe are on in, in the boardroom now and maybe thinking about the next role. Hmm. Yes, um, I mean, I think uh, when I thought about my portfolio, uh, but also when I was still in the executives wanting to make sure that I had all the tools in the kitty. I, I did two things. First, it was to fundamentally invest time in knowing what I didn't know about the industries that I was working into as an unexed. This was very uh, something that I thought I had a responsibility to, to come to terms with because that's the beginning of solving the problem. And in bridging that gap, I looked inward you will be surprised that uh, uh, the executive, mid-level to senior executives, who are, if you wish, the engineers, the, the lawyers, they generally know the business. And I, I invested a lot of time going to the operations and having conversations with this to understand the business from inside, because they come to it from a technical perspective, uh, where I was coming uh, to it from a strategic a risk and an oversight perspective. And I found that to be a very effective way of uh, in creating some kind of fusion between what I knew and what I didn't know. So I found that that was very uh, helpful. The other thing that I did was to make sure that I didn't become a slave to my technical background. And, and I'm interested in what Sandra is saying, that you know, if you are a lawyer or an accountant, you can run the risk that we, you see every problem through the legal lens and you can end up being the legal advisor on all things. And, and I was very mindful not to be uh, unduly preoccupied with what I used to do. I focused more on where was my journey going and what are the new set of skills that I needed in order to be ready. And I was also quite clear that as I moved forward, I was going to build on my mining expertise, but I wasn't going to be an executive director in the mining industry because I was afraid of being pigeonholed. So, so I think these are some of the things that as people think about their journey, 
it's it's more not so much about me providing the answers as offering possible questions they can ask themselves do i want to embed myself in my technical there's nothing wrong i just chose not to and if so you know what does that mean and if i don't do that how do i balance that value that capital that i've created technically uh with moving forward uh, but transistent such that it isn't a noose around my neck. So, so I think that, you know, those are some of the things that, are, that I would share. And then from that moment, when the headhunters come and say, well, where are you? What are you thinking? I had an answer for them. I am fundamentally a mining executive. However, this is what I'm looking for. I want to leverage that, but I don't want to be pigeonholed. And I want you to look for opportunities that allow me to both build on that, but grow and, and be, reinvent themselves. Because otherwise, if you can think about it, Rachel, I would have still been a mining executive only working from home. And that makes for a bit of a dull life, I would say. And so I think those are some of the things that uh, I, I could share with uh, the audience. Thank you. So that goes to that point about investing right at the beginning in yourself and really thinking long and hard about where you want to go and what your value add is and staying true to that message. Um, absolutely, Carol. absolutely. Brilliant. Carol, uh, tips that you can bring in? Yeah, I'd say my top tip would be don't wait for the phone to ring. You know, I think that um, there's nothing wrong with being proactive and getting out there, but do it in a do it in a very planned manner. You know, hope is never a strategy. So what I would suggest is, you know, choose the, the sectors and the, and the industries that you think you want to be a part of. So is it within, within, your, within the mining sector? Is it, you know, is it within your sector or is it tangential to, um, <clears throat> to mining? Or is it sports or is it the arts or is it education? Whatever it happens to be. Choose the, an, um, one or two sectors and then go down through the list. If it's a publicly listed board you want to be on, then I don't think your first or even your second board position is going to be a FTSE 100. So I'd probably not put any of those on my list, but I'd be putting all the AIM companies on my list, all the FTSE 250 companies on my list, <clears throat> maybe some of the Toronto Stock Exchange companies on, or ASX uh, companies on my list. And then filter those down to which are the companies again this goes back to the due diligence point which are the companies that i think i would want to work for you know do do i like the management team do i like the assets do i like the culture what are the things that are important to me that i would not like to work for that company um and you do have to do a lot of due diligence um and on, on that and it's all you can all be desktop it can be leveraging your network getting finding out from people what they think what is the reputation of this business? And then, you know, take that, that real, you know, um, planned approach and then go out there and start approaching. There's nothing wrong with proactively picking up the phone and, and phoning a chairman or phoning, or phoning a headhunter that you know looks after that particular company. Um, also find out, and this is easy because it's all publicly available information, but you can find out the rotation of the non-execs. So who, which, which non-exec is about to rotate off and then off that board in the next one or two years. So you start your planning early and you create a spreadsheet so you can work out who your targets are and at what stage you might want to target them and then leverage your network to be able to get you a conversation with the chairman or with the, uh, or or with that um, that headhunter. Um, and I absolutely agree with that point. We say all the time, if there's if you've done that focus, do not hesitate to pick up the phone. If there's an organization that you want to join and you can see your seat at the table, what is the downside of making that call? So totally agree with what you've just said. Sandra, I'd like to to bring you in at this point to uh, see what what tips you can you can share. But I love that spreadsheet approach, Carol. That's that's fantastic. Pretty impressive. Um, really is, yeah. And it takes a lot of time. This is like anything. If you're looking for a job, it's like having a job. And I think you know that that is how to approach the the Ned roles as well. Um, my first tip would be to to do follow your passion. Don't be afraid to look outside what you you currently do, or you know perhaps go back to you might have loved horse riding as a child. What organizations are there out there? Because um, there's a lot of volunteering 
um, volunteering opportunities. And, you know, it's such a fantastic way to develop your skills. Uh, so I can't recommend that enough. Um, do your homework. I think we've done that to death, but I, I would also always um, speak to, if, if you're at the stage where you're interviewing and you're getting close, you just want to talk to, to everyone and, and a company that you want to be part of really shouldn't be afraid of you having a good old dig around and have having proper conversations with people, including advisors. I would obviously always speak to uh, the lawyers and, and probably the auditors, but um, you know, you'd be amazed what people will will tell you um, and and it's all really valuable stuff. It won't necessarily make the decision for you, but it should go in the mix for sure. Um, let your when we talk about networking, it, it really is key that you let people know that you are interested in, in doing this. And I think because we've got so many people who are on boards, I imagine none of you ladies are, are terribly backwards and coming forward. So that's fantastic. Um, I, you know, my first board seat came from me having a conversation with a banker of all things. Uh, and just saying, you know, I really, really looking for something different. And this is the direction I think I want to go in. Um, and him saying, putting putting one and one and one together and making three. So, yes, it's a, it's a bit of luck, but um, but you've got to be out there and you've, you've got to be when we can finally get out to events. Um, make sure you do that. Uh, and lastly, information is power. So that having that toolkit, making sure that you're confident that whether it be remuneration or you know um, audits, having a having a comfort level with financial statements, those things are critical. They will be assumed knowledge. Um, you might get in the door without it for various reasons, but once you're there, your confidence in yourself as a board member will will ebb away if you if you don't know what to expect and you haven't you haven't you know educated yourself on some of these things. You don't need to be a governance expert. Um, heaven forbid. The world has enough of those, but um, but you really do need that underlying confidence because these are you know every entity has financials, every entity has um, people being paid usually, and those are where the the troubles tend to start, the flare ups tend to happen. So make sure you you know um, have a good really good grip of of those areas before you start. Brilliant, thank you, Sandra. Carol, I'm conscious that we're getting to five o'clock, and I know you've got. Um... Uh, somewhere else to, to be uh, at five. Um, so um, in case you have to uh, uh, leave us whilst we're still wrapping up, thank you very much for, uh, it's been a brilliant discussion and thank you so much for your, for your contribution to that. Um, what I'd like to, to do now is we've got, um, before we wrap up, I'm, we have got some questions coming in. Um, not sure I'm on how you want to deal with that in terms of do you want to pull them away and, and take them offline? Um, um yeah I, I can take them away and um perhaps we can get back to you on, on that if that's all right but there was one interesting observation I, I did make is that a lot of the ladies who are joining us today the ladies and the gentlemen who are joining us are sitting on different uh board roles two three board roles is there a magic number can you sit on too many roles can you have too many roles there's definitely a magic number and that's and that's just you know that's your capacity and only you can know what your capacity is how many hours in the day in the week do you want to you know do you want to allocate um and it's um it's yeah it's it's very individual but what i would say is a board commitment is you know is a minimum of four years right so you can't just kind of wing it and then decide you're maxed out and you're a wreck and you're just exhausted and then and then decide you need to you need to leave like you just can't do that so you just need to give it some pretty good thought before you before you say yes yeah i was going to say that it's also about the optics uh Think about it this way, you're a chairman of a board and this person comes and they have, uh, they sit on 10 boards. My first thought, thought would be, you know, can they give us quality time? And, and, and so it, it, true that it, it, the magic number is capacity, but it is also what the message is that you send out if you seem to just take any board that happens to come along. Uh, and, and so I think in terms of those who are looking, it's important that you manage those optics. They, they could inadvertently send, send the wrong message. Brilliant. Well, I'm conscious uh, we've got one more uh, poll uh, question to, to, to throw in there, I think. Um, uh, Carol has to leave us now. So thank you so much for joining us.
Um, right, so uh, are you ready with your board CV? Is your board CV ready, yes or no? Okay, 58% uh, have said yes, uh, which, is, uh, which is great to hear um, because as I said right at the beginning that, that board CV is uh, so, so, so important. Um, and uh, for those 42% who have said no, uh, then I would say the first challenge is to uh, turn your exec CV upside down and uh, start, uh, start writing it uh, from your committee uh, experience, your current net experience down and start really pulling out that, that value add. So I think uh, we've come to uh, an end uh, to, to this session. Um, from, from, from me as, as obviously a director of women on boards, uh, thank you to, to Women in Mining uh, for giving us this opportunity. And I think it's fair to say over the coming months, we're gonna be doing one or two more things with you uh, to cement the, the relationship. Um, but if you are interested in obviously hearing more about us, uh, then, then do have a look at the website. Uh, registering with us uh, is, is, is free. Um, so take a look uh, and see whether at some point we can support you. Um, but that's enough on that front. I'd just like to say thank you to Sandra. Thank you to, to Sheila uh, for those brilliant, for your brilliant contribution to the panel. And I'm sure um, everybody uh, has really thoroughly enjoyed it. And also, Amen, Amen from, from my perspective, thank you so much for your brilliant uh, organisational skills and bringing this all together. So I'm sure you want to wrap up, but that's, that's it from me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm gonna hand over to Sandra, who has a few closing remarks. Thanks, Amon. Uh, huge thank you to Rachel. Thank you again for moderating. Uh, you've done a brilliant job um, with, with, um, with all of us. And thanks to Sheila and Carol for, for those amazing insights. I know I've certainly learned a lot today. Um, I, I don't think there are many of us here who are not already members of Women in Mining, but if, if there is anyone out there, um, you'll all know that uh, Women in Mining UK is a volunteer run nonprofit organization. Uh, we promote the employment, retention and progress of women in the mining industry. So everyone's welcome to become a member, regardless of gender or where you are in the world. So please go to our website to join us now. Membership is free. And I think that's it. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>